Oh, stream. Stream looks good. Recording. Hold still. Yeah. All right, all the recordings are stopped. I check with him. That last person will stop the streaming, and they're going to give me an indication. Apparently, that person is only giving a two-minute talk. Yeah, I see. <laughs> That's not even a real talk, yeah, so... Uh... Oh, it must be it's one of those black talks or lightning. It's a certain See, uh, yeah, it's like the flash book. Yeah. You're going to book a trip to Zimbabwe? Not, uh, but my mother, I think, just arrived. Uh, a few days ago, so okay. probably not this year because they're coming over. My parents are coming over. Yeah, okay, good. No. Oh, they need some. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize you were saying
Good morning. People can hear me well. So welcome everyone to the third day of our spring symposium. The first speaker of the day is Chiaki Kobayashi. Thank you, Chiaki, for joining us. And she's going to talk about the relationship between star formation and chemical evolution. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this exciting conference. Uh, and they were uh, asked to me give a, a talk on the relationship between star formation and chemical evolution, which is not easy. As you can see in this movie, it's very complicated. We have to uh, think about various physical processes. And that's what I am going to uh, try to do in this talk. So uh, I'm going to run this uh, movie a little bit again more. So as you saw already, the chemical enrichment took place in the filament before they accrete onto the uh, massive galaxies, like supernova-driven winds distribute heavy elements uh, from the small galaxy to intergalactic medium. Some of the metals fall back to the massive galaxies. Some of the metals ejected again uh, by uh, AGN-driven winds at later times. So we have to uh, consider these processes which are uncertain. Also, star formation is also uncertain. That's the complication. However, once we form stars, we know uh, we have quite a good understanding what should happen afterwards. If the formed stars are massive, more than 10 solar mass or so, they explode as uh, quark called supernova, supernova or hypernova in a short time scale, producing uh, a lot of oxygen. Low mass stars can produce a lot of iron if they are in a good binary system by a different type of supernova, thermonuclear explosion observed as type 1a supernova. Single low mass stars can add a bit of elements, mainly carbon and nitrogen, 
during asymptotic giant branch phase. Massive, massive binaries can add neutron star, a neutron star merger as well to produce heaviest element. Therefore, in a galaxy, total amount of heavy elements, metallicity, but also elemental abundance ratio evolve as a function of time. So we can use this information to understand the history of the galaxy. This approach is called galactic archaeology and very popular for the Milky Way galaxy. Which element come from where is summarized in this periodic table in each little box as a function of time. Big bang nuclear synthesis can produce only heavy elements, hydrogen, helium up to the bottom, uh, while he all elements heavier than ca carbon are produced in stars. Most of the elements are actually produced by blue quark of supernova because I included not only normal quark of supernova, but also hypernova that produce this heaviest ion peak element, including zinc, electron capture supernova that's producing this uh, light neutron capture element, and mag small amount of magnetorotational supernova that's produced the heaviest element up to uranium. AGB stars produce half of carbon, 75% of nitrogen, uh, more, large fraction of the first peak of neutron capture element, and most of the barium, and most of the lead. This is known, but I'm showing in a different presentation. Binaries, type 1 supernova produce mainly this ion peak element in red, but also a small fraction of heavy alpha elements, silicon, sulfur, argon, and calcium. Neutron star mergers are included, but surprisingly, the contribution is very small. So neutron star merger is a confound site of rapid neutron capture elements. They produce some, but uh, by mass, they are uh, very small. This was surprising. OK, uh, the, the chemical evolution can be calculated by this one equation. Amount of heavy elements in a gas phase can be uh, calculated. It's increased by metal ejection from stellar winds and supernovae. But this amount decreases if some of the metals are locked into stars. So this is a negative term. And this quantity also evolves as a, uh, following this inflow or outflow to the system we are considering. The first three terms are nuclear astrophysics term. So these uh, three terms are highly depend on nuclear reaction rate, but also the assumption of initial mass function and binary uh, physics. The last three terms are galaxy evolution. And uh, uh, there are three different models. So the, most, the simplest one is called one zone models. They are still very useful to quickly check the nuclear astrophysics input. The second model is semiotic models, and Rachel already explained this on the first day, so I'm going to skip that. And the third one is hydrodynamical simulation. These are very expensive, but these are the models that can include inhomogeneous chemical enrichment, also can predict internal structures, metallicity radial gradient, and also can compare to the IFU data. So these are the models we would like to use for future uh, studies. So this is the one zone uh, model lines, uh, the most important figure in the chemical evolution of galaxies, showing the alpha to ion ratio as a function of uh, metallicity on the x-axis. In the universe, the first stars formed, by definition, the first stars are outside of diagonal, it's at minus infinity. We don't know the property yet, but uh, the property of these fast stars, mass and rotation, has been uh, constrained by comparing to the elemental abundance of uh, extremely metal poor star in the Milky Way. Then, uh, the, the, this metal poor star explode as a normal supernova. And this abundance pattern is implanted in the uh, population two stars uh, in the solar neighborhood. So the oxygen is more produced than ions, so it has a positive value and a roughly flat up to a few by H minus one. 
If you watch minus one, type one A supernova become dominant in the solar neighborhood, which produce more ion than, uh, than oxygen. So this quantity alpha to oxygen to alpha to ion suddenly decrease to zero, zero. That's the solar ratio by definition. And this, uh, this evolutionary trend is also implemented in the population one star uh, on the disk plane. So oxygen is one of the alpha element, and then up to calcium, these elements are all called alpha elements. So because of this relation, in extragalactic studies, high alpha and low alpha are used as a proxy for old age and young age. This is a bit complicated. This is not a linear relation. It's followed by this plateau and the decreasing trend. If stars are very massive, the situation will be very different. Very massive stars, by definition, it's more than about 100 solar mass. So I've included only up to here so far, but stars from 140 to 300 solar mass, they explode as pairing stable supernova during oxygen burning. So they, this area produces a huge amount of heavy elements in this gold color uh, in a very short time scale. This is a poison. Above 300 solar mass, so that's a pair of super, above three solar mass, uh, the, there is a bit of a mass loss, but probably they just collapse to uh, intermediate black, black mass, intermediate mass black, black hole, or if there is a bit of heavy elements in the envelope, the mass loss becomes very efficient, and uh, suddenly this 300 solar mass star becomes steady solar mass. It behaves like a normal gold supernova. So uh, these, the above 1,000 solar mass, which are not included in my model yet, called the supermassive stars, originally it's defined as a star that undergo GL instability before the hydrogen uh, burning. And they are uh, uh, expected to collapse into supermassive black hole. These are cutting edge stellar evolution calculation and very uncertain. Uh, but I can show you the chemical evolution tracks for the standard case in red, assuming standard Kluver IMF, including wolf rayet stars. So when I say wolf rayet that includes not only the ejection by wolf rayet but also uh, all effect from rotating massive stars. So some of the elements are produced during the evolution, and they may be ejected by together with supernova. But all of this effect will increase nitrogen. So the uh, points are the stars, very accurate abundance, elemental abundance measurement in the nearby stars. And a red line, I think, matches very well with the observational data you can see. That's the uh, above. And the bottom part is for uh, uh, the different coordinates, but are for extra uh, galactic studies. As we already heard some of them, neon has a, a secondary component as well, so it's increased as a function of metallicity. While sulfur and alpha, uh, some of them are produced by type 1A supernova, so it shows the increasing trend at metallic, high metallicity end. With the pair instability supernova, uh, that now, now IMF is assumed to be very top heavy, so you can see the huge impact in blue color. For example, alpha to ion massively reduced, while sulfur, sulfur and argon to oxygen ratio will be hugely increased. This is one dex of difference. That's why I said that it's poison. If there are fair stable supernova, the element of abundance will be very different, and we should have already seen the effect. So now uh, I included all of these into the hydrodynamical uh, simulations, and this is a case for zoom-in simulation of a Milky Way type galaxies. So here, the, the biology component formed in a very uh, short time scale by accretion, by assembly of small gas rich galaxies beyond redshift 2, while disk grow later on with a longer time scale from inside out. So this is CDM in shallow conditions, so we can't avoid these small galaxies keep on coming, making the streams and so on. Uh, 
but uh, later on, uh, this will become a fairly good disk galaxies. I don't have, clock is not working, but <laughs> don't have so much time, I guess, so I'm gonna go on. So this is a snapshot of present day epoch. So I'm now showing the metallicity map of the simulated galaxies based on the Aegean view, and red is for metal rich. So there is a strong radial gradient and a vertical gradient. This is pretty similar to what we have seen in the Gaia data. So the bottom of the Gaia map includes billions of stars. And the metallicity is highest on the plane and also highest at the bulge. Alpha to ion map looks quite different. So the alpha to ion uh, ratio is lower on the disk plane, including the bar. And there is a strong vertical gradient. That's also pretty similar to what we have seen in the Gaia data. So the same alpha to ion is which diagram, but with hydro simulation now. So that it's not only line, but also scatter at a given metallicity. The scatter is caused by inhomogeneous enrichment. The basic feature is the same, the plateau and the decreasing trend. The, the color contour shows the number of frequency of stars, and then we can see this bimodal distribution. Here's a peak, a high alpha peak, and low alpha peak. This is much discussed in a galaxy, Milky Way community now. So looking into the simulation more details, uh, there are various physics we can discuss. For example, I highlighted a couple of highlights. Uh, we find two different gas flows. The one gas flow is uh, along the plane. It's a radial flow of metal enhanced gas. And then uh, chemical, the chemical evolution is ongoing, so it has a high alpha population. While another flow is uh, more coming from the top, so in four of metal poor gas, and this has a low alpha uh, uh, abundance pattern. And this later phase of this in four actually st steepened the metallicity gradient in the simulated galaxies in the last uh, three giga year for since redshift 0.3 or so. So stars uh, on the plane are rotating, circular orbiting, but they are not at the same location all the time. They change the radius. This effect is called migration. So on the average, they are still circular orbiting, but uh, we find on the, uh, on the average, it's an uh, outgoing flow, so stars tend to move outwards following the cosmological growth of the disk. So this actually flattens the metallistic gradient. How much time do I have? Okay, good. So the last part is cosmological simulation. I showed already the movie uh, earlier, so I'm gonna uh, move on. The first question is, how much heavy elements uh, produced are ejected from each galaxy? So we try to quantify this by using the equation top. Uh, this equation used all uh, the quantity of the present day galaxy so that the observer can use the same thing, initial mass function. Uh, and yields, and then uh, the present day elemental abundance in stars and, and gas. So what we find as a function of mass here is the, this first sequence here, uh, the value is negative meaning. So these galaxies gain metals by uh, inflow, and these are uh, star forming main sequence uh, galaxies are located in this, in this trend. Quenched galaxies, however, appears in the top in this quantity. Uh, low mass galaxy lost oxygen, uh, up to 80% so 80 of oxygen uh, by supernova driven winds. While massive galaxies uh, lost 20% of metals or produced oxygen, in this case, by Asian driven winds. And then this, uh, uh, this galaxy location actually correlates with the environment in our simulation. As a result, the mass metallicity ratio uh, exists both for stars and galaxy stars and gas at all redshift. So here, uh, my, my PhD student, Dinah Ibrahim, uh, calculated 
uh, this uh, mass metastatic relation using cosmological simulation, applying exactly the same nuclear senses, but changing feedback. So feedback is very important. They, they change the, the, the shape of the, the normalization of this mass metastatic relations. Quanti qualitatively, the most, most, more, more massive galaxies have high, higher metallicity, which is consistent with observation. But if you look closely, none of these models are perfect. So there is something still mismatches here. Uh, having said that, my student concluded that the stochastic feedback is actually better. Our previous, uh, our future models are using the thermal feedback, but uh, the me mechanical feedback, so not the stochastic, mechanical feedback red line is the, the best one. The same student, Dinah Abraham, also analyzed the metallicity radial gradient. As you can imagine, the gradient value depends on the, uh, the method of feedback. And again, to explain this quite flat gradient in observational data, mechanical feedback rate seems better. As already we discussed yesterday, we rarely see galaxies above this positive gradient. Uh, the same statement we had yesterday, and this is something fundamentally simulation, maybe doing something wrong. Then finally, the elemental abundance. So uh, I already touched this. The so nitrogen comes from uh, uh, AGB stars. So the, in hydro simulation, this AGB population contribution appears already at the low metallicity. So that this plateau is cre created by inhomogeneous AGB enrichment. In our case, uh, in a one zone calculation, however, people uh, argued that this plateau is caused by wolf rayet stars. Our simulated galaxies follow this trend. So we said there is a universal trend, independent of redshift. This is nuclear physics trend. Comparing to observed data, uh, stars, and, and, and so on, this gray bar, it it's agrees very well. We didn't change any nuclear sensors yield here. We just used the nuclear astrophysics output, put it in a hydro simulation, and then we got this matching. I was very happy on this until I say this, GN the data. <laughs> this is re re literally no figure, no figure is literally this. So that this is uh, something that is completely different. So now we are uh, going back to the nuclear uh, astrophysics uh, problem. And then I have a, a, another model with this is one zone calculation again. But uh, uh, I can actually explain this observed range of high nitrogen to oxygen ratio with wolf rayet enrichment, if I assume dual starburst as in this figure. Not only GNZ11, there are a couple of more galaxies showing very similarly high nitrogen to, abund high, high nitrogen to oxygen ratio. So in this, in this model, uh, the star formation actually starts from redshift 16 with a small amount, but that's enough amount to increase the metallicity up to subsolar. And at some point, just before the observed epoch, there is a, dilute, the, the, there is a gas infall which dilute the metallicity. So the metallicity line goes back to the left. And then soon after, wolf rays start producing huge amount of nitrogen, but not oxygen. Oxygen has to wait a bit until the quark supernova explodes. So in this, this brief moment, Nitrogen is enhanced by wolf rayet, but quark lab supernova haven't happened yet. This tiny duration of the time, I can get this high, very high nitrogen to oxygen ratio. Okay, so I think uh, I am done. Uh, just to summarize, I was asked to talk about the recipes for galaxy evolution. I said star formation uh, uh, results in chemical enrichment of gas directly, and also the stars formed from the enriched gas, so the second next generation of stars also have higher metallicity. I talked about infrared flow, migration outflow, not so much about merger and supermassive black hole glows, and then initial mass function can be constrained by elemental abundance. Why I want to see the elemental abundance? Because it can determine star formation history more accurately, but also can constrain the initial mass function 
even with GWST, we may not be able to see the first stars, but we will be able to constrain what was the first star. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, Chiaki. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, what questions do we have for Chiaki? Brian? Thanks, Chiaki. That was really great. Um, I'm trying to reconcile your plot of the oxygen uh, loss fraction versus uh, this work in the local universe sort of doing metal budgeting, showing that you know, maybe 20% of the oxygen is kept in the disk and the rest is in the CGM and maybe a small amount ejected from the halo. Yeah, so, so this is what, what we, we get in the simulation. So, uh, and then this quantity includes halo, halo population as well. So this implies that the, the, the Milky Way size galaxies, the metals may be ejected from, the, the, from disk to halo, but never come out from the disk, from the halo, which may be inconsistent with the intergalactic medium observation. But also, there is a new maker resolution effect as well here. We actually can't resolve the disk structure in this resolution. So that's another, another uh, caveat. OK, thanks. Yeah. And I also note that this is not loading factor. It's an integral of loading factor. Hi. Thanks for this talk. It was great. Um, I had a question about the nitrogen <laughs> of the GNZ11, and, and uh, yes, you s if I understand correctly, so you can reproduce the nitrogen uh, through rotating wolf radius stars uh, due to Barsi star formation, which is very nice because we find similar star formation histories in the simulations, but also you expect that um, kind of abundance only for a very short period of time. So I wondered how likely it is that you expect to actually catch the galaxies, let's say, in that period of time, and so in how many galaxies, because I guess that if we look uh, and find high nitrogen in all of the galaxies, then maybe it's not that mechanism because you, you don't expect it to be very likely, and yeah. Yeah, so this phase is less than one million year. So I expect this event will be uh, very low. However, this is soon after the star, star burst. So the observationally may be selectively, uh, selected, observationally selected by this ep episode. Uh, how frequently? So my, the same PhD student is uh, included this nuclear synthesis already in the cosmological simulation. So we will see how many these nitrogen enhanced galaxies in a cosmological volume. <clears throat> um, hello, going back to that plot about the oxygen fractions for the, as a, as a function of stellar mass, you, you were talking about the, the more higher mass galaxies which had a net, like yeah. a, net in, a net metal inflow of oxygen. So I was curious where you, where you, thought, those, where you thought that was coming from. Uh, yeah, these massive galaxies, sorry, so I didn't. Yeah, sorry, yeah. exactly where, where you're seeing there, we have the net gain by yeah. metal inflow. And so is that suggesting that, they're, that, they're, that, these, that these halos have more metals than, than they're yeah. actually producing? That's correct. Yeah, okay. on the, on, at the net, net flow, yes. The metals actually come from outside. Like from the IGM inflow? Is that the idea? It, the, we didn't look at this, but could be the external enrichment. But also, uh, it's a, because of the simple equation, so anything, this recycling also add up as a gain. So that's also uh, adding in this equation. OK, great. Thank you. We do have time for one more question. Farla? Just one more question. This is about sulfur. So for sulfur, some of the studies found that there is a lower abundance uh, sulfur overall versus the solar abundance. I don't know if the chemical evolution models reproduce that, or there is something that uh, we need to understand about sulfur outside the ICFs. <laughs> so uh, the sulfur is alpha, uh, how to say, the sulfur, 
I actually don't remember what's the solar ratio here. Sulfur to oxygen, <laughs> I actually don't remember this quantity, where is the solar ratio. Uh, the sulfur come from 1A, so if you're looking at all the population, the sulfur to oxygen ratio may be lower than the solar ratio. Okay. Yep. Great, thank you, Chiaki. Um, let's That's go to awesome. the next talk of the session. <laughs> Sorry. So our next speaker is Florent Ronan. He is going to talk about different regimes of star formation across cosmic time. So it's to adjust the screen. I will give you a presentation after 10 minutes. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to show a couple of results from recent work in collaboration with uh, Oscar Aguirre, Sandra Romeo, and Alvaro Segovia Otero. So let me start directly. Let's jump to the topic. Let's make a Milky Way with simulation. This is a gas of Milky Way mass galaxy. It has 10% gas fraction. And it drives its instabilities and creates structures such as our arms that we know and love. Uh, now let me keep everything the same except one parameter. I'm choosing one parameter only, which is gas fraction in this galaxy. I put it to 40 percent. Sorry. 40 percent here. So you see immediately that the gas is having a uh, different uh, morphology, different kinematics just from this movie. If it was a Milky Way galaxy, 40 percent gas fraction corresponds to achieved to 2.5, roughly speaking. All right, is it better? Yeah. OK, so, so we now have a gas-rich disk at 40% uh, at uh, uh, fraction of gas. R roughly speaking, that corresponds to a redshift 2 for the Milky Way. The difference between these two cases is not in terms of the stars, because the stars are still the main driver of the instability regime. But by putting more gas, the molecular phase is playing a more and more uh, an increasing role in the instability. So you get a new regime. And this galaxy is actually not making spirals, but instead this clump, these clumpy disks that we have seen before. So this means that during the life of a galaxy, when it burns its gas, and when you decrease the gas fraction between, say, redshift 2 to redshift 0, you're going to have a transition of the regime of instability between a clump-driven, that make this, to a disk-driven, the tumor regime of instability that we learn in school. And by running many simulations like this one, we found that this transition occurs at the gas fraction around 20%. So of course, this has an effect on the morphology, on the kinematics of your galaxy, but also on chemistry. Because star formation is not happening in the same way in this giant molecular cloud and these giant clumps. Here we have more, okay. <laughs> Here we have more vigorous and, uh, and rapid star formation in these clumps, and by doing that, you boost your alpha over Fe abundance ratio. So this is something you can see, as we have seen in the previous talk, uh, in the Milky Way, for example, you will see that in a SIG disk in a high alpha sequence. So I can use this simulation and study the properties of the clouds which form stars. So this is what I do. I plot the mass versus the size and the velocity dispersion of a cloud versus the size. Just a disclaimer here, I'm not looking at the molecular phase only. I'm just looking at overall densities because it allows for a, a more fair comparison between low gas fraction and high gas fractions. So this is again for 10% gas fraction, roughly speaking, redshift zero. I can fit relations between these quantities like so. It's reminiscent of Larson scaling relation, but it's not the same because I'm not doing that on the molecular phase only. And I can repeat the same exercise with the clumps or the gas clouds at 25% gas fraction, and 40% gas fraction. And you see the relations that don't really change, the average don't change, meaning that the clamps in gas-rich uh, galaxies at high redshift, they follow the same lessons like scaling relations as at low redshift. But what has changed is the range these values take 
in mass, size, and velocity dispersion, and also the dispersion, the scatter around these relations, as you can see here. So there is a lot of information in the scatter. So let me use this and illustrate that with one cloud here. I'm going to define an excess mass, which is how much mass on top of the average expected value it has. So how up from this line it is. And I'm going to plot this excess mass for all the clouds as a function of star formation indicators. Let's do that with star formation rate. Again, these three gas fractions there. And what we can see is that the clumps with an excess gas, so on the right to this panel, uh, have high star formation rates. I can repeat the same exercise for the time scale for star formation or fast you form stars. That would be the depletion time. And they have this, uh, this cloud with excess mass, they have short depletion time. And I can do the same with the efficiency of star formation, so mass of stars divided by total mass. And I can have uh, high star formation efficiency. Or maybe more precisely, I don't have low star formation efficiencies in these clumps with an excess mass. So let, this means that if I compare two clouds close to the average, so in these color bands here, uh, we have large scatters of all the quantities, much larger than if you have an excess of mass. And this is compatible with, with what we have seen in many other simulations and also in observations uh, for local disks. So the relations only become tight, or, or you have a strong correlations for the outliers, for the clumps that have too much mass. So you might say, okay, but you know, it makes sense that if you have more gas, you form more stars. So maybe it's just an effect of a mass and not the excess of mass. It's not true, because if I replace the excess of mass with the mass itself of, of the gas, this is what you find. And frankly speaking, it would be a shame to put any line there to, to fit this, uh, this cloud of points. Uh, very, very weak correlations, if any. So it's not an effect of a mass, but an effect of the excess of mass for the cloud size. So clearly here we ha what we have is a universality of star formation regardless of the redshift or gas fraction. And on top of that you have outliers uh, of which the excess of mass are gonna boost star formation activity in terms of rate, time scale, and efficiency. So all this is for clouds, is for galaxy uh, evolving intrinsically in isolation. But of course, galaxies are uh, in, involved in cosmological context, so let's take that into account for the second part of this talk. For this, I use a Wintergatan simulation. It's a zoom-in cosmological simulation of the Milky Way-like galaxy, and we have used it to look at a lot of different aspects, including the effect of last merger mergers, which is coming now. And uh, what I'm going to show you now is the globally, the, the galaxy has a one object, the evolutionary star formation activity. So let me plot here, as a function of time, you have different uh, scales if you prefer, uh, the evolution of depletion time, so fast you burn your gas. Big Bang is to the right, present day is to the left, and you see these drops in the depletion times that match the epoch of merger mergers here. So we retrieve what we have seen so many times in isolation in, uh, in the local universe, major merger trigger starburst with short depletion times. But if you look a bit more closely, you see it's only valid for this time window. Not later, to the left, because we don't have a major merger after this epoch. Okay, there. And not early on, even though we have some major mergers early on. And to understand why the star formation activity of the galaxy is not responding to the stimulus of an interaction, what Alvaro Segovia Otero did was to look at the properties of the galaxy itself. And what we found, is that uh, if you look at the, the different uh, kinetic components, the velocity dispersion or rotational velocities, this is where they behave. So at early on, your disk is a mess, your galaxy is already a mess, and you have velocity dispersion of the same order of rotation velocity. And it's only after, in this case, redshift about five, that the rotation takes over, you get a rotation supported disk, your disk settles, and then you have current response, which means that this packet of gas is going to respond similarly to this packet of gas to an interaction. So this is why <coughs> you need uh, organized motion to be in place to have a current large scale response to the interactions. So another way to show this is to plot the depletion time 
as a function of specific star formation rate. Early on, we have some major mergers, but not systematically starburst because the disk is not in place yet. So it's kind of a mess. Later, the disk settles. Every uh, interaction, every wet merger merger will trigger a starburst phase. You're mostly to the left of this plot. And after the last merger merger, then the disk become more quiet, and you have in your secular phase of evolution. So the Milky Way, roughly after a redshift of one. But maybe surprisingly, you don't see a correlation, you don't see a monotonous evolution or a bijective evolution between these two quantities. So there is no correlation between the specific star formation rate and the depletion time. Another way to phrase that is saying that we have an instantaneous indicator the mass of gas in your galaxy and the star formation rate at time t, that you cannot compare directly with the cumulative history if you integrate your star formation rate to get the stellar mass that you need for your specific star formation rate. Phrased differently, the present day activity does not have to correlate with the history of your galaxy. So if I rephrase that, I take this plot and I normalize the specific star formation rate with that of the main sequence of galaxy formation. I can use the one defined observationally, or if you want a more fair comparison, the one from the simulation itself. But in either case, you see it's really a mess. You don't have a trend, you don't have correlations, you don't have a clean bijection between these two quantities. So this means that a starburst galaxy, for example, could be found within the main sequence. They could hide there. And a few weeks after we proposed that from this simulation, it has been confirmed observationally by uh, Lars Siesler and collaborators, for instance, who found indeed galaxies, starburst galaxies, which were hiding within the main sequence. So to me, that's a call that maybe we need to revive the concept, or at least the interpretation we do of the main sequence of galaxy formation. So to conclude, in the first part of the talk, intrinsic evolution without cosmological concepts, I told you that we have different regime of instabilities in gas-rich disks that lead to this clumpy morphology. We have similar scaling relations for the high redshift clumps at, as at low redshift, but with an increased scatter. So same universal trend plus uh, outliers. These outliers are extreme gas clumps in addition to the mon normal molecular clouds. And therefore, we have different regimes of star formation in these outlier clumps, which is driven by the excess of their mass and not their mass itself. If we look at the cosmological context, mergers do not trigger starbursts before the disk is in place, so not at very high redshift. Some starburst galaxies hide in the main sequence, and that makes me think that we need to revise the concept of main sequence, because we definitely have different regime of star formation across galactic disks and cosmic types. Thank you. Thank you, Florent. Um, so, what questions do we have for Daniela? So, uh, thank you very much. A very nice talk. Uh, I'm trying to make a, a mental picture of what a starburst galaxy that is hiding in the main sequence might look like uh, observationally. So, for instance, uh, there are galaxies nearby that have uh, starburst centers amid uh, a very general disk that. Uh, wouldn't probably move this galaxy away. Is this what, uh, what uh, I should think, or these are something different from it's, this type of situation? It's part of it, yes. But it could be anything, as long as you have sudden or recent boost of star formation, which has nothing to do with your history, how, how you build up your, your stellar mass. So what matter is your, your you know, the, if you look at the starburst as how much, uh, how much star formation rate you have per unit of gas then it does not have to create with a stellar mass with everything that you build up across cosmic time. So if you have a recent burst, then you could be a star burst, local, concentrated, in patches, in clumps, in mergers, whatever. Hey, so thinking about these clumps that have higher mass per their size and lie above, um, so given if they have high, or they do not have low star formation efficiencies. Do you imagine there will be any implications to the types of stars formed in those in terms of distribution of metallicities or IMF? I stayed away from that on purpose. Uh, 
I want to say uh, these have some implication for star cluster formation for sure. And you see the trend, you know, we have seen on Monday, for instance, that it seems to create also with a AMF and, and the maximum mass of stars you can form, these kind of things. This is orders of magnitude away from my resolution limits. I cannot make any more predictions than just the theories that are found in the literature and in this conference. So I will not, I will be cautious. <laughs> Thank you. So our next speaker is Mia Bovell, uh, and they are going to talk about near and far more detailed evolution in the future. I'm just going to turn this off while I get it on to look it up. Okay, is the mic on? Okay, excellent. I apologize, I don't have any movies, so I figured I would include gratuitous eclipse pictures, since all, chemical, since all the chemicals that we're talking about at this conference do come from stars. Um, so I'm going to be talking about modeling chemical evolution using some analytic models. Uh, I've got the usual list of collaborators at the bottom of the slide, but I particularly want to highlight Sachi Weosuria, who is going to be giving a flash talk on Friday on using these models on the Centaurus A system, and Anshura Sadai, who is an undergrad working with me at Caldwell University. So JWST has given us an absolutely tantalizing and breathtaking look at metal enrichment before cosmic noon. Um, this is from Morishita et al. 2024, which is a reanalyzed sample of 25 galaxies from a redshift of three to a redshift of nine, looking specifically at the oxygen abundances. And I'm probably one of the few people that would stick a plot of abundances that are above a redshift of three next to an image of the Milky Way. But the reason is that if we want to calibrate these models, we need to calibrate them in the data sample where we, where we know the metallicity as well. And that is in the near field. That is the dwarves of the local group. So um, just as a reminder of the power of semi-analytic models, this is a plot that is effectively baryonic mass resolution of simulations as a function of the number of gal resolved galaxies in the simulation. So as you go up on this, you have an increase in resolution. The high resolution simulations like the Justice League and Fire are up here resolving the dwarves, but they don't give us very many galaxies. The number simulations in general that do large number of galaxies don't have the resolution. But I also added another axis on here, which is the number of physical models you can run. So it's not just about statistics of the galaxies, it's about the ability to just play with physics without taking a month and a half of computer time. And SAMs sit right up there in this phenomenal sweet spot. They are incredibly computationally efficient, and I am hoping to show you in the first part of this talk that they are able to successfully model the dwarf galaxies of the local group. We are using Galacticus. Um, this is actually an illustration done by Sachi, um, by Benson et al. 2012. And uh, Marvel, don't sue me, please. So the first step in any model is to constrain that model. We have chosen to constrain it using the luminosity function and the luminosity metallicity relation of the Milky Way dwarves. The pink curves throughout these initial set of slides will always be the Galacticus models. For the luminosity function, we do try to match the observed luminosity function, but we also take a look at the Mint Justice League simulations and the fire simulations because the observational luminosity function is inherently incomplete. So if you try to match a simulated luminosity function to an inherently incomplete observed luminosity function, you're gonna probably not have the right set of astrophysical prescriptions and parameters to actually replicate the actual universe. We are also able to simultaneously match the luminosity metallicity relation of the Milky Way dwarfs. So this is what we constrain to. This is what we use to choose our star formation history recipes, our feedback recipes, everything. 
And we are able to replicate the luminosities and the metallicities of the dwarf galaxies of the Milky Way down to the Sloan ultra-faint dwarfs. And this ran, I think, in an hour and a half on a laptop-ish. So the next thing we did is we said, OK, so we match the luminosity metallicity relation and the luminosity function so that we know that we can get the luminosities of the dwarves and we know that we can get their metal enrichment histories and their feedback histories. Can we also replicate their other properties? And the answer is yes. We're getting roughly correct half-light radii and roughly correct velocity dispersions for the dwarves at z equals zero. But I titled this talk Near and Far. So when we do this, are we also getting the star formation histories right? Are we getting stuff right at high redshift where we now have JWST, which is giving us all this incredible information about galaxies that we've been hearing about? The answer is yes. Um, this is our version of the parameterization of, a star, of star formation histories that Kardec talked about on the first day. This is, um, comes originally from Weiss et al. in 2019. And uh, I'm going to try to do this without advancing the slide, but I make no promises. This is cumulative star formation history. This is the time at which 50% of the total stars have formed. This is the time at which 90% of the stars have formed. These are the plots for the Milky Way and the NM31. This is Galacticus. So we are able to replicate the um, star formation histories of the Milky Way dwarfs. What this suggests is that if we calibrate to what's going on at z equals zero, we've got a good chance of also, getting, of also being right during the first billion years. So I do need to pull the hood back a little bit. Our work up until now, including what I just showed you, assumed an instantaneous metal recycling. So this basically said the stars form, all of the supernova explode, they have a given yield fraction and a given, um, they have a given yield and a given sort of yield rate. And that tells you how many metals are in, how many sort of total metals go into the gas from those supernova explosions. However, that assumes a solar oxygen to iron yield. And the one thing we are learning about the high redshift universe is that assuming that a solar oxygen over iron yield is happening during the first billion years is probably um, not accurate. So instead, we have introduced a non-instant metal recycling, which treats the timescale in the ejecta from type 2 supernova on a 4 to 10 million year timescale and type 1a supernova on greater than 100 million year timescales differently. Basically, what Galacticus does is it goes, it creates an IMF, it populates an initial mass function, we know the mass of the stars. From that, we figure out when the different supernova went off, and then we do a population average yield for the oxygen and iron separately. And the first thing we did was we made sure that we didn't break the luminosity metallicity relation that works so well with the instant feedback. So that worked, which is it's always nice to make sure you didn't break what worked. And then we started looking at the alpha abundances relative to iron. Um, since I don't know how many people are familiar with this, I thought to do a quick primer. In general, higher iron abundance has lower alpha abundance. This is happening because as you move to higher iron abundance, there have been more type 1a supernovas, which are primarily causing iron. I apologize for anyone who does detailed abundances for overly, horrifically oversimplifying the field. But this also means that as you move down here, that means there's more extended star formation because you're looking at the metallicities of the stars. So these are stars that formed out of gas, out of, the, out of gas that has already been enriched by a whole bunch of type 1a supernova. And this, you can actually see this here. This is work that Ensuras has, has done. Here's alpha. We're using oxygen as our tracer of our alpha abundances versus iron. The color code here is showing increases in stellar mass. And you see that as you move to higher iron, which you would expect, and lower alpha abundance, you're also moving to higher stellar mass, which you would expect to have more extended star formation histories. So it all tracks. So the last piece of this is the delay time distribution of the type 1a supernovae. So this is time versus the number of supernova 1As that go off. This is a power law from 
Friendlich et al. 2012, so you have some sort of normalization, time to some power. Um, or you can use an exponential, which has a different normalization, e to the negative t, um, such as that seen in Strogler et al. 2020. And first off, we check to make sure that both of these are able to roughly replicate the luminosity-metallicity relation. They both do, check. And we would expect that the exponential, since 1As are forming in general later, will have a steeper dependence of alpha. And that is, that, that is exactly what we see. The brown is the power law. The pink is the exponential. But then the next, but this is a model. There's a universe out there that actually has data. And it's good to compare your models to the data. These are the curves for... Um, from Kirby et al. 2011. These are the average curves for five of the Milky Way dwarfs. And this shows that we clearly prefer an exponential time, uh, delay time distribution for the type 1a supernova based on the alpha abundances of the Milky Way dwarfs. All right, so we know that this, we now know what delay time distribution to use. We know what normalization to use because our luminosity-metallicity relation looks good. So now we can finally go to high redshift and take a look at what's going on there. And so we're going to take a look specifically at the oxygen abundance. Unfortunately, Galacticus does not trace nitrogen, so I can only really look at the oxygen abundances. So this is Morishita et al. 2024. And what Takahiro did is he reanalyzed a sample of galaxies from JWST GTO observations taken by Massimo Stiavelli, as well as observations from JADES and Nakajima et al. 2023. So all of these galaxies have been analyzed using the exact same pipeline. So there, it's, a, it's not a heterogeneous sample. It's a completely homogeneous sample. And he finds this trend for galaxies from a redshift of three to about a redshift of nine in oxygen abundance. The colors of the points here are redshift, and I'm not gonna break this down in redshift bin here because I'm still working on some of the details. This, the pink here once again is Galacticus with an exponential delay time distribution for the type 1a supernovae. The black line it shows is this line here. So we are able to roughly replicate the oxygen abundances, the oxygen versus mass abundance at high redshift. I did not tune it for this. I tuned it to replicate the alpha abundances and the iron, and the iron metallicity relation at, low, at z equals zero for the Milky Way dwarves. And this is a 10 to the 14 solar mass halo at or between redshifts of six and nine. And so take on points. Um, we can now use semi-analytic modeling, specifically with Galacticus, to reproduce the properties and the star formation histories of dwarf galaxies down to the ultra faints. Critically, this can be done on a laptop. This can be done in a reasonably powerful laptop. Some of the models I showed you here, I literally ran on my, Ma on my MacBook Air. The alpha abundances of the Milky Way satellites are in strong agreement with an exponential time delay distribution for type 1a supernova, similar to the form given in Stroger et al. 2020. And we are tentatively able to reproduce the oxygen abundances observed at z equals three, but please watch this space over the next couple of weeks because I should be able to tell you more. So thank you very much. And I will, and I will put the eclipse pictures back up. Thank you, Mia. So we have time for one question. Daniela. I guess I'm getting more than my air time. So my, uh, it's a, should be a, a quick question. Uh, um, how much uh, your models allow, for instance, for the fact that there might be a variety of star formation histories uh, from uh, redshift infinite until today, you might have uh, an instantaneous burst at some point uh, or uh, a moment in which there is no star formation for a short period of time uh, and things like that. So how much sensitivity do you have to that? Um, the best 
the models in, the models actually inherently account for that. So you have sort of a range, a large range of star formation histories. I just didn't have time to show that particular plot. The best way that we can account for that is actually by building up our statistics. So the obvious next step is to run instead of one 10 to the 14 solar mass halo or one Milky Way, you run 100 Milky Ways. You run 100 10 to the 14 solar mass halos. So you get as much diversity in the star formation histories as you possibly can. Yes. Yeah. We're limited by the dynamic range of the EPS trees or the dynamic range of the M-body simulation we're using. But other than that, it's sort of ask and you shall receive. Thank you, Mia. Let's move on to the next talk. So our next speaker is Jennifer Mead, and they are going to talk about the effects of population three supernovae on the formation of the first enriched stars. I will give you an indication of the gender as well. All right, can everyone hear me? Is the mic actually on? Everybody yes, okay. All right, so after the overdensity of people from New Jersey on Monday and the underdensity yesterday, I'm not sure if I have to report that I'm born and raised in New Jersey, um, but I did leave New Jersey to do my PhD at Columbia University with Greg Bryan and Mordecai Maclow. Um, and the work I'm gonna talk about today is done with the EOS collaboration. Um, and I will be talking about the effects that population three supernovae, so we're going way far back in time, um, have on the formation of the first enriched stars. And I put an asterisk there because that is what I was going to talk about, and I still will a little bit, um, but I found something really cool that I actually would rather talk about. So we'll get there. Um, but first things first, since we haven't really talked too much about population three stars, um, I thought I would quickly review some of the main uh, properties of population three, namely that uh, first, they are for the most part largely unconstrained. We do know some things about them based on observations that we have of stars in our own Milky Way galaxy and in dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, but uh, you know, simulators can kind of do mostly what they want with them. Um, Population three stars are thought to have a top heavy IMF. So you may have heard that population three stars are thought to have like 100 solar masses or more. Um, the current thinking is actually that they're a little bit smaller, that they have maybe tens of solar masses, but they're still top heavy. Um, they are metal free, so they consist of only hydrogen and helium. So population three stars are the ones that sparked the first steps of chemical evolution in our universe. And they only form in like by the handful, right? So you only have a few that are forming in each halo, and this is because gas that is in those, those halos have no metals in them, so we're not able to cool through metal lines. And so we're cooling through molecular hydrogen, which happens slowly. Those gas clouds collapse uh, and cool slowly, and so they don't fragment very much, and we're able to form more population, or only a small handful of pop three stars. Oh. That was strange, all right. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about like the very first step of chemical evolution and that's about it. So I want to justify why we should care about a single step of chemical evolution. And so the first thing to think about is just, you know, population three stars are right now completely hypothetical. We've never actually observed one. And so understanding how this chemical evolution occurs um, we'll determine how long we're able to form these metal-free stars for and what our chances are for observing one in data that we can collect today. Uh, on the, you know, conversely, we can also think about when metal-enriched star formation happens. Um, and the other like, modeling kind of side of this is that population three stars set a metal floor that is often just implemented in models that don't model population three. And so understanding what that metal floor is, is very important for the models that are doing only enriched star formation. We also care about it observationally um, because we see a lot of metal poor and extremely metal poor stars in our galaxies. And so those are what we use to constrain the properties of population three. 
And we can also learn about the physical drivers of chemical evolution, things like gas mixing, things like the stochasticity of the IMF, um, you know, uh, the ratios of different nucleosynthetic processes, and how those differ from high to low redshift. So because we are doing, uh, you know, population three, and these are forming in by the handful, we're not fully sampling the IMF. And so we need very high resolution simulations that are star by star. And this is where EOS comes in. Um, so EOS is a code that, or a simulation that's run by the code ENZO. It is star by star, meaning that each individual star particle is actually an individual star. Um, we have fairly high uh, mass as well as spatial resolution. And we do full radiative transfer as well as have background and local Lyman burner radiation. Um, we have molecular hydrogen self-shielding, which helps to protect uh, those stars that are forming from the local uh, different sources of Lyman Werner radiation. Uh, we track different elements from three different nucleosynthetic sources. And the last thing I want to note is that our POP3 IMF has a characteristic mass of 20 solar masses. So hopping straight into the results, um, I'm just going to say right off the bat that the first step of chemical evolution, the first few steps actually, are highly non-monotonic. And what do I mean by that? So typically when we think about chemical evolution, we think, okay, we're setting off a supernova and we're constantly in, you know, enriching that galaxy, right? We're increasing the metallicity of that galaxy. But in the early universe, we're talking about halos that are 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 solar masses in dark matter. And so those halos actually can't hold on to pretty much any of their metals. And so many, many halos expel nearly all of the metals that are produced into the surrounding CGM and IS, uh, uh, IGM. And so the plot that you're looking at up here on the top right is the fraction of metals that exist in halos um, at that time. And so you can see that, you know, depending on how you define a halo, whether you define it as row 200 or you subtract the virial radius of the halo, you have between zero and 10% of your metals actually that were produced actually sitting in your halos, which is not very much. And we can look at this in a different way by looking at the um, metal loss fraction. So this is defined as pretty much the fraction of metals that were produced in the halo versus the you know, what is actually in the halo. And so things that have lost all of their metals set up here at a fraction of one, 100% metal loss. And we plot this versus the dark matter mass of the halo. That's what halo mass is. And you can see that in this little gif here that all of these halos that are pretty much below 10 to the 7 just float right up there. They have a supernova go off, and then they lose all of their metals. And it's not until about 10 to the 7 that you start seeing this turnover again. And if we look at the foremost mass of halos in the simulation, that's exactly what you see happen. They have supernova go off. They lose all of their metals. Sometimes stuff starts to recrete but it pretty much gets blown out by another supernova. That's what those little white points are until they hit about 10 to the seven. And then they start to re-accrete very rapidly and supernova do not actually have a strong effect on blowing out those metals. There's a similar story for the gas where you see that a lot of these halos as they have supernova go off, they're pretty quickly blowing out all their gas having uh, low gas mass. Um, and it's not until about 10 to the six that they start to retain their gas. And so thinking about this gas, right, where the metals are going, where the gas is going, um, prompts thinking about uh, what happens to the stars that form after those supernovae explosions. And so the way we're going to think about this is thinking about the recovery. Oh, that was not the, let's go back. Thinking about the recovery time. So the recovery time we define as the amount of time that passes between any star formation event and the previous supernova in that halo's history. And so this plot's a little bit complicated, but we have gas mass on the y-axis, recovery time on the x-axis. It's colored by that same loss fraction that we were just looking at. So again, one is 100% gas loss. Minus one is like you gained all your metals back and then some. Um, things that have different color outlines represent the type of star formation you're doing. So is it pop three, pop two, or both? And then squares versus circles is just the onset of star formation versus extended star formation. So you have multiple time steps that are doing star formation in the halo's history. And so there are a couple of things to note. Um, first, we have a whole bunch of uh, star formation events that have pretty much zero recovery time, meaning they recover in the next time step. 
Um, but these tend to be, not always, but tend to be um, star formation events that are extended. So these are where our galaxy is rapidly accreting gas, right? So we're not blowing out that gas as well, and we are having extended star formation. They also have fairly high metal retention, kind of this green-yellow regime. The other thing you'll note is these little tracks that we have here. Um, they're not actually that weird. Uh, it just means that we formed a star and we formed, you know, we had extended star formation, but no supernova go off. And it's actually consistent with the lifetime of about a 25 solar mass star, which is exactly what we have in that simulation. The other thing you'll notice is that there's definitely areas on this plot that are totally empty. So we don't have small gas mass galaxies that have long recovery times. We also don't tend to have large gas mass galaxies that have short recovery times. And so the way to think about this, I think, is you know, think about it better, is to look at the onset of star formation rather than all of the extended star formation. And so if we remove that from the plot, we only look at when star formation starts, we notice that this trend still holds. Um, but I think the way to think about this, um, and I don't want to do that, um, is that halos with more gas very likely are forming more stars. And so, and they have longer recovery times, and it's been, you know, discussed in some, uh, some work that it's possibly because of the stronger ionization feedback from having more stars. And so this is work that we still have to look into, but it seems consistent. Now, the cool thing that I wanted to talk about, um, which is the reason I'm not totally talking about enriched uh, the onset of enriched star formation is because we actually found this population of uh, second generation population three stars. Um, and so these are stars that are pop three, they're supposedly metal free, but have formed after an enrichment event, which is not something that you would expect. And so we said, all right, we, well, we have to look into that. And so we did. And this is an example of one of the halos that are forming pop three after uh, an enrichment event. And so let's let it run back to the beginning. You see that there is a star up here that it exists in and it goes supernova. And we get another star that forms down in this very dense cloud at the bottom. And so this is a subhalo that's coming in with essentially pristine gas. You can see the metallicity here on the right. That is a very metal poor pocket that is coming in and it's not being enriched by you know, the, the environment that's around it. And so the second generation star formation is actually predominantly, for most of our halos, taking place in these subhalos, these dense unenriched pockets that are either coming in or exist in the parent halo, which is that, that red circle there. Now you might say, okay, well, is all the star formation, you know, all that secondary star formation happening in subhalos? And the answer is no. Um, but I unfortunately can't tell you why, <laughs> because we have not been able to look at uh, yet what's happening with that in situ star formation. So stay tuned because we will be looking into that and I think it will be very interesting. Um, but with that, I'm going to leave up my conclusions and take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. What questions do we have for Jennifer? You mentioned the characteristic mass of your IMF, and I was wondering how is that IMF either generated or chosen in the simulation? Yes, yeah, so our POP3 IMF is simply a saltpeter IMF with like a slope of I think minus 1.4, whatever's typical. Um, but the characteristic mass for the ones that I'm looking at right now is 20 solar masses, and so we have an exponential cutoff below that. We also have runs that look at a characteristic mass of 10 solar masses. Um, we do find that there are differences between the simulations, particularly in how much ionization you get. Um, so that's something that we are looking into. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much all we, all we do. Have you thought about exploring some more extreme shapes at the IMF? Uh, I have not, but I'm sure it's something that we could do. Um, do you have suggestions? <laughs> Things you'd like to see? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering about the uh, difference between the mass gas mass retention and the metals retention. Yeah. Um, so, like sort of what's driving why you have to get 
a whole order of magnitude higher in dark matter mass before the metals get removed. Yeah, so we think it's an efficient mixing pretty much, right? So you're, you're blowing out your metals into like the surrounding CGM and the surrounding IGM, but they're not mixing very well at first, and so you recreate more pristine gas earlier. Great, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Valentina Abril Melgarejo. I'm a postdoc here at SDSCI. So I will share with you my most recent work on mapping multi-phase mixing of uh, metals in a star forming galaxy. So we know that metals are fundamental ingredients of galaxy evolution and we are mostly interested in um, knowing what are the time scales of this uh, mixing of metals in the ISM of these uh, star forming galaxies and if there are significant <coughs> localized variation between uh, the, the neutral and ionized gas phases. For this, uh, we targeted a famous high redshift analog that we have been discussing uh, since Monday. Uh, it's NGC 5253. We have a very nice um, composite of uh, data set of uh, optical eye view from MUSE and six uh, pointings with cost targeting 11 star forming regions. Uh, this galaxy uh, has characteristics that are reminiscent of a, galaxy, a star forming galaxy uh, at the cosmic noon. So I showed you here uh, the beautiful cost data that we have with a bunch of absorption features that we model with uh, void profiles to access to column densities. So we have um, neutral gas abundances from UV spectroscopy and ionized gas abundances from optical eye view. And, um, here I showed you the difference between uh, these abundances uh, as a function of age. So we see that most of the elements have higher abundances in the ionized uh, phase except for iron because of uh, a strong iron depletion effect. And uh, our main results are uh, regarding nitrogen. So for these very young clusters, uh, we have nitrogen uh, production from wolf rugged episodes. So we see um, positive correlation for the neutral gas uh, as a function of age in a, in a counter correlation, uh, an, an anti-correlation, sorry, for the ionized gas. And these distributions um, uh, match uh, around 15 mega years. So we see that chemical enrichment happens differentially first in the ionized gas phase and then in the mixing out into the cold neutral gas phase. So if you are interested in discussing more about this multi-phase uh, chemical analysis, I'm happy to talk to you. So uh, thank you so much. Hi, I'm Laura Duffy. I'm a graduate student at Penn State University working with Mike Heraclius and also Mallory Molina and a whole host of other people. Um, and I'm talking about two separate things that I worked on that are kind of related. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the second half, which is the Swift UVOT plus Manga Value Added Catalog. We combine Swift UV uh, observations of about 560 nearby galaxies with uh, Manga IFU data and SDSS observations of the galaxies. Um, the catalog was created to study star formation and its quenching in the local universe. This is the second data release, so it expanded the catalog from about 150 galaxies to about, like I said, 560, and that's available now on the SDSS4 like value added catalog section, and the associated paper is also published. Um, I mentioned that first because using the first data release of the swim value added catalog, uh, I continued work that Mallory Molina had done and I looked at um, resolved star forming regions in 29 nearby galaxies and calculated a number of um, quantities related to dust in those uh, galaxies including the infrared excess, uh, which is the total infrared luminosity relative to some UV luminosity and also the UV spectral slope beta. And we were interested in looking at how those uh, quantities were in the regions versus in the galaxies as a whole. So we essentially found that the regions 
um, were good tracers <laughs> and followed the same sorts of relationships as the galaxies as a whole, um, which is maybe unsurprising because they were kiloparsec-sized regions. And then we also looked at um, correlations with various physical parameters, and the strongest correlation we found was with the gas phase metallicity. That paper is also published, um, and that's the archive uh, number, and I'm happy to talk about both of those projects and how they relate. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is James Garland. I'm a first-year PhD student at the University of Toronto working with uh, Laurie Rousseau-Nepton. Uh, one thing I think a lot about is the relationship between structure and abundance. So in the kind of canonical picture of spiral arms, uh, the gas flow across arms and bursts of star formation should create very subtle azimuthal variations uh, in metallicity on the order of 0.01 to 0.1 dex. Uh, so as you can imagine, that's quite hard to observe. Uh, so to do this, we look at NGC 628. It's a perfect test bed for this. It's a uh, face-on nearby grand design spiral. Uh, and we need high quality data. So we turn to the signal survey, which we'll hear a little bit more about uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, so this has uh, over 4,000 emission line regions in NGC 628 with a number of useful uh, emission line fluxes uh, at very high spatial resolution and spectral resolutions. Uh, so extremely preliminary data, uh, even just from strong line methods, we see uh, interesting trends azimuthally and radially, uh, splitting regions arm versus interarm, the leading versus trailing side of the arm, uh, and the more we split up this subset of data, uh, the more interesting things come out. So uh, there's a lot going on under the hood here that I'd love to talk with people about, especially photoionization model grid fitting, uh, structure identification with machine learning models, uh, anything about radial inflows and gas mixing, uh, and I'd love to hear anybody's ideas about this project, so feel free to reach out to me around the conference, over Slack, or at my email there. Thanks. It's good timing. So um, this image is a collapse of a data queue made from the CITEL instrument at the Canada-France Hawaii Telescope. It is um, real colors, <laughs> my favorite uh, real colors. So you might uh, be uh, tempted to start to identify some supernovae. I see some of you have already started. Um, this is M33, if you have recognized it. And if I would zoom in at any corner of this image, um, you would be able to see some uh, young supernovae, old supernovae, star forming regions that are bound, INS bound, matter bound, some are leaking photons. Some are relatively old, some are relatively young, and you see diffuse gas everywhere. The little green dots are planetary nebulae, and they're about the resolution of this data, which is about 0.8 parsec. And this is part of the single survey. It's only two fields of the instrument, and we have nine fields over this galaxy. They would probably cover half of the room if I had put the whole image here. So it's a beautiful data set. Um, the survey is based on local volume limited sample of galaxy at 10 megaparsec. We have a spatial resolution that goes from one parsec roughly to about 40 parsec. Resolution on H alpha is 5,000, and we are gathering more than 50,000 H2 region with this sample. We have coverage of the diffuse gas, planetary nebulae, supernova remnants, and we also have information on the dynamics, internal dynamics of H2 regions. Um, this is just an example of the collapse of three data cubes that enables us to gather many emission lines, mostly strong emission lines. And we have developed many tools to develop this catalog of H2 regions and emission line regions, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple of the things that can be done with this amazing catalog, including studying luminosity function, a different sample of the, the survey. You can maybe select your favorite density, your favorite metallicity range, and take a look. Um, you can also study the the, the structure, so had the radius of the region, the dynamical um, internal properties of the regions. And you can compare with models. And one thing that was not necessarily uh, mentioned yesterday was modeling in 2D, photonization model in 2D. And that's something that we can do at this resolution. Um, there's many people in this room that are part of the signal survey. Some of them are here, and you just heard James. If you're interested, come and talk to us. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Ava Paulzine. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. Uh, everybody's been talking about low metallicity galaxies, so I'm continuing the trend. Uh, basically, in this regime, despite it being very much key for a number of different things that we want to look at, a lot of the models that we use are extrapolated from high metallicities, and this makes sense. I mean, there's a huge volume of data at high metallicities that we just don't have. Uh, but <laughs> that actually leads to some problems. So for instance, if you look at the molecular hydrogen fraction compared to the density of hydrogen, you can see that it falls off drastically below about 10% solar metallicity. This is actually expected because the, the formation time of H2 becomes longer than the lifetime of typical GMCs. But this poses problems if you're, for instance, trying to get an accurate H2 mass or use uh, H2 for star formation rates. So we have a model here. It's shown in pink. This actually does work. You can recover accurate H2 masses. But we caution it should not be used for star formation rates because, as it turns out, star formation rates and H2 abundances decouple at low metallicities. Instead, it is absolutely critical that we start modeling star formation directly. To that end, <laughs> we have started looking at how star formation actually proceeds in these simulations. Uh, if you are interested in star formation efficiency, as I think many people here are, this is <laughs> a relevant thing to look at. And we find, actually, that we're able to reproduce in the simulation with no fine tuning the fact that the star formation efficiency shown here on the top is flat with respect to local galaxy properties. This is consistent with observations and consistent with uh, simulations of individual GMCs. But on galaxy scales, we also see this. There's limited dependence on metallicity, UV field strength, uh, or gas density, but we think that this is actually due to turbulent self-regulation. If we have a little toy model where we turn off turbulence and post-processing, this goes away and you start to see a significant, actually, metallicity and density dependence. Uh, do note that the axes are scaled slightly differently on the top there. Uh, so if you're interested in star formation and low-metallicity galaxies, uh, in star formation modeling or in H2 modeling, please come find me. I would love to talk more. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Brian Welch. I am a uh, postdoc at NASA Goddard. Uh, I'm going to be talking quickly about uh, measuring direct chemical abundances with gravitationally lensed galaxies. So you've heard a little bit about this yesterday with Grace Olivier's talk. Um, basically, there are two cool things we can do with gravitationally lensed galaxies. The first is what Grace presented yesterday, which is we get much better spatial resolution. So you can make those beautiful resolved metallicity maps that she was showing. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can take this entire galaxy across this whole IFU field of view, squish it down into a single spectrum, uh, and get much higher signal to noise with much lower integration time than you can with uh, regular, not gravitationally lensed galaxy. So that was what we did in this study. Um, we took the uh, spectrum of SGAS 1723, which I'm showing the pretty picture of right there, um, made a single spatially integrated spectrum out of it, um, and we were able to detect uh, multiple auroral lines from this galaxy, so we have 4363, we have 027320, 7330, and we also have a faint sulfur 3, 6312 detection. Um, this was all with a fairly low um, integration time with JWST, so we can really get a lot of detail in a short time. Uh, and that lets us do cool things like look at the nitrogen enrichment in this galaxy, uh, which we find is modestly enriched, but with a pretty big error bar, so it's pretty consistent with uh, other local galaxies, local H2 regions. Uh, so this one's fairly normal. Um, but with the second minute of my talk, uh, I'm going to tell you about the Sunburst Arc, which is another very awesome gravitationally lensed galaxy. Uh, this paper by Emil Rivera Thorson just came out the other day. Um, one of the cool things that we found with this particular uh, JWST observation is there's really clear evidence of Wolf Ray A stars. So these two figures down here are showing the blue bump and the orange Wolf Ray A bump. Um, so very, very clear evidence that there are Wolf Ray stars. And then that red point on this N to O versus O to H plot is the sunburst arc. Um, this is just one of the uh, lensed clumps in the sunburst arc showing that elevated nitrogen um, with those Wolf Ray features so that we can kind of start to observationally probe if the Wolf Ray features are actually what's leading to this uh, uh, nitrogen enrichment. Um, seems like, at least with this particular object, that's what's happening. So um, really cool stuff. We can do a lot with cool lens galaxies. And if you want to know more, come find me. Thanks. Gary? Can we stop broadcasting? <laughs>